Let's bring in the love of our morning, uh, Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, talking about one of the favorite things for Valentine's Day. No, 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 not sex, chocolate. <laughs> Good morning, Arthur. <laughs> well, I was thinking about, you know, February and food. Yeah. Uh, last week, I think I talked about cab <laughs> carrots, <laughs> which is, of course, always... No, I've been finding them on sale. Anyway... So you, it, 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 the stupidest thing in the, in the age of the locovore, the the big food for February is strawberries with chocolate for Valentine's Day. Or if we can remember back to when we, we were kids, cherry pie. I mean, the most out of season thing you can think of for February it was because George Washington. It never told a lie, right. and when he was asked who chopped down the cherry tree, he said it was I, right. or me. It was really true. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, maybe he wasn't so grammatical, but he was honest. It was really um, actually. Yeah. I think that story has been debunked. No, so well, maybe they don't teach it anymore. The truth has come out of that story. It was Donald Trump's father who cut down the apple tree <laughs> <laughs> to build the building. Listen, you know, are you going to get me started? Because my grandfather was an electrical contractor here in Brooklyn. There you go. And did work for the Trump organization, <laughs> right. or Fred Trump. Yeah. And, um, Still and has they were, because my grandfather was very active in the electrician's union and other, you know, labor things, he was occasionally thrown into social situations with Fred Trump and his wife. You know, what is the wife's name? I, I, I looked this up a few months ago, and I couldn't even find it. I um, uh, uh, Donald Trump's mother. Anyway, my grandmother used to come back from these parties and say that Trump woman thinks her blank doesn't, doesn't stink. stink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always remember that. Uh-huh. Anyway, back to uh, yes. telling a lie in February. <laughs> Um, do you, what, what do you know about that, Marshall? About telling a lie. about the cherry tree story, or, or were you just making a joke? No, no, I was just making a joke because uh, I, I, whenever anybody talks about George Washington cutting, that, I cannot tell a lie. Nowadays, yeah. it automatically comes. Okay, there's some way you can work I got trumps you. to this. That's I got you. Well, you know exactly. Isn't that interesting? How we, <laughs> the culture has turned around on that <laughs> <That's> issue. <right. laughs> Presidential truth. That's right. Uh, But the one sensible food for February, I think, is chocolate, by the way. So forget the strawberries. I never got that combination anyway, even though I know people swoon over uh, a sour strawberry dipped into sweet chocolate. Um, If I have to combine chocolate with any fruit, I would say pears are my number one fruit for chocolate. And pears, of course, are in high season right now. I've been buying very inexpensive and very delicious bosque pears. People tend to stay away from bosques, I think, because, although that's maybe why they're so inexpensive, um, because they're hard as a rock when you buy them in the supermarket. Give them at least two days on your kitchen counter. I had I ate one yesterday that I bought last week, and it was divine. So buy your pears ahead of time. They won't be hard and, and sour. They'll be tender and sweet. And you dip a pear into chocolate. I think that's a very good combination. As far as berries go, I prefer raspberries to strawberries. And I know, yes, they're sour too, but no, much what can better. I tell you? Much better. Pardon me. Much better raspberries. Much better. Yes, oranges are. Gr- oh, I love orange and chocolate. And you could buy mandarins and make little mandarin segments and dip them into chocolate fondue. I like chocolate. I mean, what is chocolate fondue? Chocolate fondue is not fondue. The word fondue actually just means melted anyway. So yeah, it's it is in in truth it is melted chocolate. Um, it is what chocolate fondue, what we used to call chocolate fondue. I don't even know if anybody uses that expression anymore. Um, is is what nowadays people say is ganache, and ganache can be either chocolate melted with butter. It's not really buttercream because. For buttercream, you need, it's more complicated. Um, but if you just melt chocolate in cream, as it cools down, it will firm up, and you can ice a cake with it. The other form is cream, heavy cream, with uh, chocolate. And uh, that can also be made so that it, you can put it on a cake. 
but I think I'd rather be eating it in other ways. And in one way would be to dip fruit in it. I love that. That all said, um, Bob and I go to a restaurant here in Park Slope that is sort of Austrian. I say sort of because... They have a lot of Austrian food on the menu, but they also have other things that are totally made up for the local clientele. Uh, Let's just say that. Anyway, the owner is, in fact, Austrian, and he has three sensational Austrian desserts on the menu, including what he calls chocolate custard, but we would call, I think I would call, uh, Bob certainly calls, chocolate peau de creme. Now, Paul, is it Paul O'Krem? Paul O'Krem. Is, oh, Paul du Creme, no, Paul du Creme. It means a pot of cream. However, uh, it's not just a pot of cream. It's always flavored with something. Interestingly, if you go online, you will find, you can take a look at, traditional uh, Paul O'Krem uh, or Paul du Creme uh, pots. And they're little ceramic cups with covers. And if you've seen them before and wondered what's the cover for, I mean, you know, it's because the traditional recipe is baked in a bamery in the oven. It, it is a baked custard, in essence. It has egg in it, and the egg, cream, chocolate, all baked together into a, a beautiful custard. Uh, so, and then, and you need to cover them. Now, if you don't have traditional uh, pots for pots of cream, um, you just have to put a piece of aluminum foil over each custard cup that you do use. And it, do, it does need to be an oven-proof custard cup. So I have pudding dishes that I've had for a thousand years, and I use those for everything. And mine would have to be... Um, covered, but I did unearth, because I'm cleaning closets and disposing of things. I'm not disposing of these, but I did unearth some four. It seems I only have four uh, of these covered little pots. So I may actually do a little, uh, half a recipe today, because most of the recipes would make eight of these. By the way, a great uh, a receptacle for a pot au creme, or pot de creme, or whatever you want to call it. Chocolate custard. Pot de creme. Um, pardon me? Pot de creme. Pot de creme, okay. If your French is good, you can say pot de creme. Otherwise, you say pot so, of cream. Pardon me? Otherwise, you say pot of cream. Yeah, how about chocolate pudding? So It's uh, the same, right? A great receptacle are um, espresso cups. Mm. So if you have espresso cups, that can go in the oven in a bain-marie, which is gentle heat, after all, 325 degrees. And when it's in a bain-marie, um, uh, it's, it's more modified even than that. Now, the big thing with, with any chocolate, ganache, pudding, buttercream, any chocolate dessert, truly, other than chocolate chip cookies, is what chocolate do you use? There are, in my supermarket, there is an entire... I was going to say an entire half, but there's a half an aisle, a long aisle, only with chocolate. If you didn't know anything about chocolate, you would go crazy trying to decide what chocolate to use for anything, even for eating. So, And nowadays, I, it's even more confusing because uh, they'll, they usually label chocolate with a percentage of how much um, uh, cocoa, uh, the, the cocoa liquor, which is basically the flavoring of chocolate. It's the, it, it, it's the, uh, there's fat and there's solids in, in a roasted uh, cocoa bean chocolate. And once it's ground, um, that's called a cocoa liqueur. Cocoa itself is the solid part. And in fact, if you uh, white chocolate, as I'm sure everybody knows by now, has no chocolate liqueur, no cocoa liqueur at all. It is all just uh, cocoa butter, and then it's usually flavored with whatever vanilla, maybe almonds. I mean, it depends. Anyway, so now they're putting all these percentages on, and I, you know, I, I, even I am confused. Say, even I, I don't know that much about chocolate. 
I'm learning little by little here. Um, I did learn how to taste chocolate uh, by, from a professional quite a few years ago. And so when I do bring a new chocolate home, I do the little tasting routine, which is you take your, a small piece of the chocolate and keep it in your mouth for a couple minutes. I really mean uh, more than just a few seconds until it really starts to melt. And then I'm going to make a terrible sound um, uh, right now, but this is what you do. You go, you put your tongue up on the roof of your mouth and you cluck between the chocolate and your, the roof of your mouth and your tongue. And that brings up the aromas and flavors of the chocolate so that you can determine more than it's just sweet, not sweet, you know, get some of the nuances. And there are plenty of nuances in chocolate. I actually prefer funky chocolates uh, as opposed to mm, elegant chocolates, let's call them. Uh, but, you know, it's sort of hard. I, I've hardly ever met a chocolate I didn't like. Um, <laughs> but I do buy. So what I buy lately is um, Calabout. By the way, it's not Calibo. C-A, I think it's two L C A L L E B A U T. But it's Calabout because it's not French, it's Flemish. Uh, it's Belgian chocolate. And uh, 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 they sell Calabout in my market for, it's, I can't believe how cheap it is. It's $16 a pound. Um, so I buy a big half pound chunk, it's only $8. And that's a lot of chocolate. And we eat that as table chocolate. It, it, I'm guessing, because it's, it's not labeled as such, but I'm guessing from knowing other chocolates, that it's a 70%. So 70% um, chocolate is pretty bitter. It's, it's a bittersweet chocolate. I wouldn't even call it bittersweet. I would just say it's a, a dark, slightly bitter chocolate. If you don't like dark, slightly bitter chocolate, you're not going to like what they sell all over, I see now, these big hunks of Calabout um, uh, but uh, there are so many, I don't even want to recommend a particular chocolate beyond this. But this is the only one I know intimately, so to speak, <laughs> because I keep it in the house um, all the time. In fact, we have like a, 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 no more than an ounce of chocolate after dinner is our big treat. And um, Bob once went to a doctor who told him to do this. <laughs> I think it was his allergy doctor who was sort of a holistic doctor. And um, uh, so we got into the habit of having just a small piece of bitter chocolate um, as our second dessert. We usually have fruit, so we don't really have dessert. Anyway, if you go online, you're going to find a million zillion recipes for chocolate pot de creme. Um, However, I would recommend that you stay away from 90% of them. I looked at a lot of them this morning um, because they vary so much. And I, I would stick to Julia Child. And if you don't own your uh, Julia Child, um, I'm not sure that this is – I don't think this is in Mastering the Art of French Cooking 1 or 2. Um, I know it, it happens to be um, in the, um, the book she did with Jacques Pepin, uh, but I bet you it's in other books too. It is you definitely you can find it on the internet, um, and it, it, it's a recipe that's very classic, as is, you know Julia would be. It you you use uh, uh, unsweetened, in this case unsweetened chocolate, uh, because you're going to add sugar, and um, and it does have heavy cream, and has orange zest. Everybody it seems uses instant coffee as a flavor boost for not just chocolate uh, 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 custards, but anything chocolate I'm seeing. Everybody's into this. I used to. I used to keep a, a little jar of Medaglia d'Or in my cupboard. It's long gone. I wonder how long those crystals keep, because I don't bake that often with chocolate. But whatever. So it, it's very classic. You beat uh, your egg, egg yolks with sugar. You stir them. In, you stir in hot cream, you, the melted chocolate, you put it into the pots, you cover the pots, and you bake them. But the other day, 
um, I think it was in fact her Valentine's show, I was watching, uh, or at least I passed by and I stopped for a minute, uh, which is sort of my food watching mode. I don't really watch any regular food shows. But I do like, because I like her personality, and I often like the food she makes, um, the Pioneer Woman, um, Re, I forget her last name, her first name is Re. She actually does live on a ranch, and she does feed cowboys. Um, and she also has kids. And, I mean, she's a busy woman. So she has a recipe for her, and she, by the way, this is why I like her. She she starts off with how do you pronounce this word, peau de creme, or if you want to get really technical, peau de, creme. and then you have to insert a phlegmy, back of the throat, crackly <laughs> French sound. <laughs> so um, anyway, she has a very innovative recipe for for peau, peau de creme because there's no cream in it. And it's all done in a blender. The only thing you have to... And this reminds me, and in fact, I should have looked it up. I didn't look it up. This reminds me of a recipe I have in one of my early cookbooks called Mock Mousse. It wasn't really chocolate mousse, so I called it Mock Mousse. And this is... Uh, I'm going to give you this recipe because it's so easy. Um, now, she uses, which I don't totally approve of because I don't like the stabilizers, she uses 12 ounces of semi-sweet chocolate chips. Um, and she puts them into her Walmart. She tells you she bought this blender at Walmart. So it's a nothing fancy blender, but she's probably better for it. Um, I have a, I, I've told everybody a million times, I have a blender that dates to the 1960s in Oster that's still working perfectly. Uh, 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 and you crack in four eggs. Put them in right over the chocolate chips, 12 ounces of, of, of chocolate chips, semi-sweet, four eggs, um, or is it egg yolks? No, four eggs. And then um, add two teaspoons of vanilla. Um, as she says, or if you want to kick things up a bit, you can substitute a booze. I usually put in cognac, but Grand Marnier, Kahlua, Frangelico, whatever you like, actually, will work here. I don't like mint. Never would use a mint liqueur. But if you like, creme de mint is a good chocolate mint. People love it. Um, and anyway, so then you add uh, a big pinch of salt, because everything needs a big pinch of salt at least, and put on the blender lid and turn on the blender. Now, this is obviously not going to be smooth. But as soon as the mixture is blended, and by the way, I often start my blender um, or any of these machines pulsing. Uh, and when things get sort of finely chopped up, because things bounce around more when you when you pulse, and um, and and they and it gets more evenly pulp uh, processed. Um, but as soon as this is all blended, remove the little disc in the blender lid, which is you know gives you an opportunity to pour something in. What you're going to pour in is eight ounces, a whole cup of very hot, meaning just made, very hot coffee. You, at least the pioneer woman does not use coffee crystals but in her cooking, but then she confesses <laughs> that she makes her coffee <laughs> for this recipe with Folgers crystals. Freeze. I was just going to say Folgers. I was just going to say Yeah, it. yeah, she uses Folgers. She, she's an honest woman. Um, anyway, she tells you, she warns you in a way that this is all going to expand in the blender, practically fill up your blender. And then all you do is pour it into uh, the glasses you're going to serve it in. And she shows an array on her website, she shows an array of glasses. That's sort of fun, but if you have uh, six or eight of the same thing, whatever. And she says, leave plenty of room at the top. So you can top it off with whipped cream. I know that she, she refrigerates this for three to four hours um, at least um, to let it firm up. And then she tops it off with slightly sweetened whipped cream. Now, who could complain? Don't tell them it's not the traditional recipe. It's very good. I used to, As I said, I used to call this mock mousse. Well, if you call it mock mousse. Hers may be creamier than mine because hers, and by the way, this is very important. Serve it at room temperature. Don't serve it right out of the refrigerator. It'll be much better texture, much better, and even the flavor if you let it 
come to room temperature. Before, and it, it won't turn to liquid again. Don't worry about that. Uh, yeah. You with me? Yeah, I wouldn't have worried. I thought you had a comment or question. No, I'm just I'm looking at some of these recipes and I'm enjoying them. Well, anyway, so that's um, the chocolate. Yeah, that's that. Now that said, let me see if do I still have this. I did I talk about this chocolate cake that I made? That was a, a Pillsbury Bake Off winner. Um, <laughs> If you did, it has a, it, it, it was long enough ago for me to go, huh, gee, I'm curious. Tell me about that again. So <laughs> go for it. Well, I'm going to see if I can find the recipe here. But I, I, this, I think it was 1988. I was a judge at the uh, Pillsbury Bake Off, which was held in at that. I don't know. If, does it even exist anymore? Who keeps track of these? What, things? the Pillsbury Bake Off? I, I, like, how, yeah. cool to, how cool to be a judge. Yeah, I know. It was. And and also, uh, it, it was. But we were very, um, let me see if I can find this, um, this recipe. It, uh, the, we were very criticized, here it is, um, the judges, because we selected a recipe that was too simple. They said, oh, come on, this is, you know, nothing to do. Well, <laughs> that's why we liked it. Right. Um, and it was the 1988 Bake Off Contest winner, a recipe prepared by Julie Bankston of Bemidji, Minnesota. Now, I may be one of the few people you know who's ever been to Bemidji, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have. I, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, it was before 1988. Had it been after 1988, I probably would have looked up Julie. But um, and maybe I still can't. Um, uh, Bemidji is known for two things. It's the home of, um, oh, damn. Now, I, actress, I can't remember her name. Uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, let's get to the cake. And yes, they still have the Bake Off. Uh, yes, they still have the Oh, good, you looked it up. Yeah. So here's the deal. This is made with the Pillsbury Moist Supreme Devil's Food Cake Mix. <coughs> Is still sold. It is not the same um, uh, number. It used to be one pound, two point two five ounces. It isn't now. I see. I didn't uh, change this recipe. I didn't mark it up. But whatever it is, it worked. Pillsbury Moist Supreme Devil's Food Cake Mix. I bet you it works with other chocolate cake mixes as well. But the whole thing here is the cake layers, two nine-inch cake layers, are baked on top of a praline, a pecan praline. And when you unmold them, the praline will stick to the cake, and hopefully not to the pan, but I'll tell you how to avoid that. And you stack them, and you can make this ahead, by the way, because you can make the cake part ahead. Uh, I, it lasted three days, moist and delicious, in my kitchen, uh, covered with plastic wrap. Um, and... Uh, uh, the filling is, and topping is nothing but whipped cream. So I do suggest that you do the whipped cream at the last minute if you want to make this into a layer cake. Um, and that's the way it won, it, as a layer cake filled with whipped cream. So to make the praline, you melt one half cup of butter, that's a whole stick of butter, with a quarter of a cup of heavy cream, and one, which is also called whipping cream, the Pillsbury people call it whipping cream. In, in our neck of the woods in the Northeast, we usually it's usually labeled heavy cream. Um, and one cup of firmly packed brown sugar. So you 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 um, um, in the saucepan, uh, combine the butter, cream, and brown sugar, and put it over. I would say medium heat until the butter is melted. Stirring it occasionally in the end, stirring it a lot so it's all nice and smooth. And pour this. You can make this in an 8-inch. I made these in a 9-inch uh, cake pan. I just made this several weeks ago. Just to, Is it still as good as it was then? Well, you know, it's a cake mix cake. So most of us grew up on the taste of cake mixes, not on from scratch cakes. A few cakes our mothers made maybe were from scratch, some family recipes, but otherwise... They all delved into the mysteries of the cake mix. And truthfully, the texture 
of a cake mix is superior to most from scratch cakes because unless it's an oil cake. These are oil-based cakes. Oil-based cakes have the best moist crumb. Anyway, so you pour the, the praline mixture into two pans, an eight-inch or a nine-inch, only because I was so nervous about this whole thing. I, um, I put parchment paper on the bottom. It was totally unnecessary. Um, in a large bowl, now you're going to mix the cake. You take your cake mix, whatever size it is, um, and I just followed the whole recipe the way it was, a, one and a quarter cups of water, one third of a cup of oil. I use canola oil, corn oil, peanut oil, any of those, and three eggs. And you combine them and beat it on low speed with a handheld mixture or a mix mixer or a stand-up mixture, but just until moistened. So you could even do this by hand with a whisk. Um, and then beat it for two minutes. And, you know, if you use a whisk, of course, it's going to require some, some stamina to beat it for two minutes. And then pour that batter over your praline mixture, which is already in the pans. Did I tell you about the... Uh, yeah. Did I say three quarters of a cup of coarsely chopped pecans? I may have missed that. That's essential. So I'll repeat the, the, the pecan praline part. is a half a cup of butter, a stick, a quarter cup of whipped cream. And you know, you probably could find this recipe on the Pillsbury website. One cup of firmly packed brown sugar and three quarters of a cup of coarsely, not too finely, coarsely cup chopped pecans. And you bake the cake at 325 for 35 to 45 minutes. Cool it in the pan for at least five minutes. They they come out of the pan easily, um, and that's it. And then once the layers are cool, uh, you can you can uh, layer them with with the. You're going to need about one and three quarter cups of whipping cream to cover this whole two layers. You're not going to put any on the sides. And of course, you want to sweeten your cream with a little bit of powdered sugar, maybe a, a dash of vanilla. And you can decorate this cake. Now, this is what makes it a fancy cake if you want it to be. You can decorate it with whole pecans and chocolate curls. I think everybody would like that for Valentine's Day. I think that's a great idea. Chocolate praline layer cake. I found it. It's easy enough to find. I no, just, I'm sure you're going to find I it. I just yeah. found it. It was the 1988, 1988. Bake Off winner. I'm looking right and at it. Susan Westmoreland and I, were. I became friends with Susan Westmoreland because she was a fellow judge. Uh, ends up, she now lives down the street from me. Well, she's lived down the street from me for over 20 years. Um, and uh, Susan Westmoreland is still the food editor of uh, Good Housekeeping magazine. And I just to add, Good Housekeeping is one of the few magaz- w- magazines, women's interest magazines, that um, still has a food editor. And we used to say, Susan... Uh, is the good is the good housekeeping seal of approval? So Susan and I definitely voted for this cake, and wondered why anybody would criticize us for come for for, for giving a prize to such a delicious and simple cake. All right. Huh. Happy Valentine's Day. That's it. Happy Valentine's Day. Are you going to eat chocolate? No. Well, yes, I am, but Jill's not going to know. <laughs> You're allowed to have. I, you know, by the way, with as a, as a diabetic, chocolate, you know, <laughs> uh, is a very low carb dessert. Just don't, but the, the the high the high chocolate content, low sugar kind, you know, bitter chocolate, is very low carbs. All right, all it's right, satisfying Delicious. for the brain too. <laughs> <laughs> very good for the brain. Have a great week, everyone. Take care, Arthur. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, here on Robin Hood Radio, uh, robinhoodradio.com. You can also find Arthur uh, on our on-demand page as well. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467, on the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheesemongers and Grocers on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488, rubiner's.com. Hillsdale Home Chef with two beautiful teaching classes, and they've got classes to go in those cooking rooms. More information? 
518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com. And Haven Cafe in Lenox, Massachusetts, offering quality food and excellent service. Also, they feature catering. Supporting local organic farmers, environmentally conscious, and epicurious distributors, havencafebakery.com. 